But I'm here today because I can predict the future. I predict that in 24 days, 9 hours and 12 minutes, there will be a full moon right here in this city. <laughs> I predict that the next generation iPhone will be faster and have more memory than the latest iPhone. Cool, right? I can also predict who you will vote for. If you'll quit your job, if you'll lie, what you will buy, or even if you're pregnant. We humans think that we are very special and that we are very unique. But when it comes to reality, we are creatures of habit. And when you have habits, you can find patterns. And with patterns, you can predict. Now, catch this. How did you do that? Until recently, we could not build a machine or a robot that did, could do what you just did. You actually predicted where the ball was going to land in real time, just in order to close that hand in the exact right moment. Now, if we take a look at this guy, we don't think about it, but this quarterback is actually throwing the ball into the future. And the other guy, his only job is to predict when and when the ball is going to land so he can catch it and make that touchdown. Until recently, our brain was the greatest tool to predict the future. We have a built-in prediction engine that allows us to do what we call mental time travel. We can simulate the future. Actually, if we go thousands and thousands of years back, we would use this ability when we started hunting animals. Watch the animals, observe them, and learn their behavioral patterns. See how they would react to certain conditions and events, just in order to predict how to catch them up. Now, I got my passion for the prediction industry when I was six years old. I got drawn into the game of chess. I think what fascinated me with the game was that even though you're sitting in front of each other, you're actually competing in the future. Some of the great chess masters tell that they can move, make a move in present time that's based on an event, something happening 20 to 25 moves later in the game, potentially several hours into the future. So, nature has given us this ability to predict the future. But at the same time, we need to understand that this ability is limited. We can only absorb a certain amount of information. We can only understand a certain number of dimensions. We can only oversee a limited geographical space. At the same time, predicting the future is a numbers game. It's not exact science. It's about being slightly better than the guy guessing. With that, you can improve things tremendously. So, nevertheless, I'm here today to tell you that we are moving into the next level of predicting the future. And we're standing just by the foot of the mountain. The reason for that is data. Big data. Today, an ever-growing part of our real world is actually documented in data. Data from smartphones, from social media, online magazines, sensors, GPS devices. Actually, 90% of all data ever created was created in the last two years. Now, has any one of you not been on Facebook today? Please raise your hand. Oh yeah, there's a few. <laughs> okay, has anyone liked something on Facebook? Great news for you. You are not at all. <laughs> Actually, you're part of the 7 billion, not million, 7 billion likes on Facebook to date. Since I started this talk four or five minutes ago, there has been uploaded more than 1 million pictures to Facebook alone. Pictures reflecting real world people, 
real-world objects, events and emotions. Now, why is all this data so interesting in the context of predicting the future? Actually, when you think about it, you're building a digital clone of our real world. The old Mother Earth that we know is now represented in a digital form. And instead of having the humans to predict and find correlations and patterns with the limit, there are limitations, we can now bring in the computers. We can bring in the machine learning algorithms to predict to the analysis. And we can actually start finding patterns, patterns that we never thought existed. Examples. Windmills. Whenever there's a specific sound, clunk, followed by a small rise in temperature on one of the mill components, it will break down within six days. That's predictive maintenance. People who buy these guys, that goes under the chair not to scratch the floor. They are much better at paying their bills than people who do not buy these. <laughs> Vegetarians, they almost never miss an airplane. <laughs> now that's computers. Let me tell you a story about fish. Any or one of you been to the Australian East Coast? Yes? You might know that fishing is a big thing. Earlier this year, I talked to one of my Australian colleagues and he said, Thomas, you and your innovation guys really need to help us. We have this climb selling fishing equipment all along the East Coast in Australia. And they just have one wish for Christmas. They need this single information and then they would be forever happy. I said, all right, bring it on. And they say, they just need to know where the fish will be in the future. <laughs> well, the salmon be this afternoon, blue marlin two days from now, the trout next week, simple stuff like that. And I said, okay, that's all. Mm. <laughs> so I brought together my innovation team. We like to call ourselves the innovation pirates. Quite quickly, during the first brainstorm, we actually realized that fish are kind of tricky. <laughs> because they are not digital. They do not have a Twitter account or a GPS device in their pocket. And then they are underwater. After exploring a lot of dead ends, we ended up with this idea. Because we had learned one thing. Fish, in Australia anyway, would move in huge groups. And they would move down coast, turn around, move up coast. Down coast. So we had some kind of pattern of behavior that we could use. What we also found out was that the first thing a person would do when he catches a fish is this. And then the guy standing next to him would do this. <coughs> and upload it to Flickr, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. What most people don't know is that when we upload a picture to the internet, there's some hidden information attached to that. It's called EXIF data. It's data about the device name, was the flags activated or not, exposure time, but also latitude, longitude, and time stamp. So now with this location data and this time stamp, we could actually determine the specific time and place for a certain catch. So we knew that this fish had been here. So we started scaling it up. We built this program <coughs> called Aussie. Aussie is the rock star of big data analytics. And Aussie can search the entire internet for pictures taken along the Australian East Coast, tagged with words like fish, fishing, big catch, salmon, trout, and so on. We ended up with a lot of pictures. Also a lot of pictures that were not relevant for this case. <laughs> this is what we call noise, and it would actually kill the concept. This is examples. This guy picking up a girl on a bar. I think this is his like big catch of the night, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we have the salmon down here. I'm sure it tastes good, but it's not the kind of salmon that we're looking for. 
So we actually equipped Aussie with some object recognition capabilities. So now Aussie actually he programmed this functionality that enabled him to analyze a picture in order to one, determine is there a fish on it or not, a real fish, two, what kind of fish is it. This is a vector representation of a salmon. Of course you knew that. <laughs> but now we could actually start in gathering hundreds and hundreds of pictures, people catching fish along the Australian East Coast. And we could take all this location data and put it on a timeline in order to learn the behavioral patterns of the different fish species. This information we could feed to our machine learning algorithms or pattern recognition software, and we could start predicting the movement patterns of the fish. So we have the salmon in red, we have blue marlin in green, we have trout in orange, and so on. It's not Christmas yet, but I'm sure that this client will be happy and hopefully he will pull screens like this. Now this is a prototype, but he will hang screens with this information in every fishing store along the Australian East Coast, helping the fishermen time his effort. So, we can predict fish. What about human beings? Now that's the easy one. <laughs> because we have so much information on humans. And they live above water. <laughs> We had this client in the fashion industry. They had this project called the Crown Prince Experience. Now in Denmark, the Crown Prince would actually sometimes do his own shopping. And when he does, of course, he gets this personal royal service. The idea was that every customer entering a store should have this Crown Prince Experience. The same personal royal service as if it was the Crown Prince. Now, why does the Crown Prince get good service? It's because we know him. We know his interests, his likes, his personality, his history, his family. So we just had to take this and transfer it to everyday people. Now, how did we do that? We came up with this idea called collective filtering. Actually, what? Amazon does in the online world, to transfer that to the physical world. We have person A, he's 30 years old, he's a male who lives in Copenhagen, has a high education and income of $8,000 a month, he's single, he loves golf in Liverpool, he goes clubbing, traveling, he has more than 400 of his friends, he never walks alone. Okay, I just got a message in my ear that a person B just entered one of this client's stores now. So what is happening right in this moment is that the customer is entering the door and this very second he would get identified. It's called auto ID. Either by facial recognition, smartphone check-in, or club card with a chip. And in the second that we identify the customer, we can start collecting data from social media, from his blogs, from anywhere. At the same time, we have back-end data. We can buy a lot of data from data brokers. So we now know that person B is 30 years old. He's a male. He lives in Copenhagen. He has high education and income, single, golf, Liverpool, clubbing, travel, and he has more than 400 friends. Facebook. So these persons are kind of the same. And as you can see, they have similar taste because person A just bought the tiger suit, the black canvas, and the old bay t-shirt in this client's stores. Now person B also bought the tiger suit and the black canvas. Now, what would he buy next? Inside the store, the store clerk would have this application in her hand. She 
you can actually see all the customers in the store on the right, your left. She can select a customer and see a lot of information. The information that you just saw on the other slide. But also information about what items this customer would like. And as we see, we have the Obey t-shirt on the top of the recommendation list. So now the store clerk can actually approach this customer, knowing who he is, what he likes, his interests, everything. And she can hold that Obey t-shirt in front of him and say, welcome, your highness. <laughs> We're standing at the foot of the mountain, I told you so. And soon we will be able to predict the future to an extent that exceeds most people's imagination. One thing is for sure, we need to find out what to do with this newfound power in terms of ethics and data security. But one thing is also for sure, Governments and companies are going to make predictions on you and I every day. It can seem scary, but I think that the good things far outweigh the bad. If you think about it, within healthcare, we have predictive medicine. I mean, we can predict what kind of treatment might work and not work. And in crime, we have predictive policing, where we can predict future crime hotspots before they occur. Within transportation and the smart cities, within the economy and the climate, even when you're searching for a date. So, I want to end this talk with a small experiment. I don't want you guys to be stuck in status quo because you're luck and you're afraid of what the future might bring. So I created this app called the Futurizer. And the Futurizer actually simulates your future based on a lot of questions that you had to answer and put into the app. I couldn't uh, prepare a future for all of you today, but I will just simulate a small glimpse of what could be your future in 2019, four years from now. So, <coughs> I want you to take a moment and look at this picture and see what it means to you. Imagine that it is your future. So, I want you to think about what it would mean if you could see your future. What would it mean? To me, I think it means that if you have an idea of what will happen, then you can actually get on top of things and create that important space that allows you to live your life right here, right now, in the present. Enjoying that Crown Prince experience.